Good morning. Good morning. Come on. Good morning. Thank you. Hey, my name is Jody Giles. I get to be a part of the teaching team here. I also get to be uh, on the board of overseers. I get to volunteer. I get to be married to Bernice Giles. There you go, right? So that gives me a lot of credibility right there. Hey, just real briefly, uh, Gina mentioned it. I want you to know, I want you to know it is a preaching, it is a teaching team. We get together every week. We focus, we have so many different perspectives, all loving God, trying to make sure that the message that we bring you, we take very, very seriously because we all want to be greater and better disciples of Jesus because we love him. We don't want to get in the way of his word or his Holy Spirit. So I just want you to know, it's not me speaking, it is the Bible speaking, it is the Holy Spirit speaking, and it is edited and it is crafted by a team of people that want you to leave here today better equipped to serve the Lord Jesus than when you arrived. So with that spirit, let's move forward. I also get to be the treasurer here, but I am not here today to make you feel guilty about our church finances. You can go to our, our website and you can see the generosity report and see exactly how we're doing. My, my idea is, is completely different. I've been able to do a lot of things in my life. Uh, I've been able to work for some really, really cool companies. I've been able to take what I've learned at those really cool companies and the mistakes I've made at those really cool companies and, and teach those things uh, at, at a business school. And one of the things I've learned uh, in business and at business school, it's really, really important to focus on something we call lead indicators. Lead indicators versus lag indicators. So uh, let me give you a classic example. If you wanted to change your weight, if you wanted to grow in muscle and mass, or if you wanted to reduce some mass, uh, you know, everybody thinks, well, what measurement will you look at? And you say, well, I go step on the, the, the scale. The problem with that is the scale is a lag indicator. It tells you a weight at this point in time, but it is a lag measurement of a lead measurement. And that lead measurement, there's probably two. The number of calories you consumed and the number of calories you burned. So think of it this way. You, you make a bet. If you want to change the lag indicator, you bet that if you do something to these lead indicators, like calories in or calories burned, you will change what happens on the scale. Right? A, a, a book called Moneyball made this very famous uh, about baseball. Right? Number of runs scored is a lag indicator. The lead indicator to the number of runs scored is on base percentage. And that just revolutionized baseball about 15, 20 years ago. Go watch the movie. Uh, football, we're football this afternoon, right? Touchdowns is a lag indicator. The lead indicator to touchdown is completion percentage or yards per carry. And even those lead indicators have lead indicators, right? Uh, completion percentage, uh, that might be based, uh, the, the lead indicator of that might be the number of seconds that the quarterback has to throw the pass, so blocking. Or the lead indicator might be uh, the, the number of hours of practice. If you're in school, the lag indicator is what you got on your quiz or your test or your paper. The lead indicator is the number of hours you put into preparing for that quiz or that test or that paper. Unless you're in my New Testament history class right now and there seems to be no correlation to the amount of effort I put in and my quiz scores. <laughs> lead indicators versus lag indicators. So those are all relatively easy, but you didn't come here to talk about revenues for your company and you didn't come here to talk about baseball and you didn't come here to talk about football. But I, 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 by the way, I used to work for a, a really cool uh, 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 sport apparel company and we used to invest a whole lot of money in athletes, right? Now that is a really risky proposition to take a young athlete coming out of school and get them to wear your product. And you're having to forecast, are they gonna be any good professionally on the field? But you also have to forecast, are they gonna be good morally off the field? I mean, we invest millions of dollars in this. How do we know that this young athlete coming out of school is going to be morally successful off the field? What do you think a lead indicator for that might be? You're right, the parents. When we can meet with the parents, that was a really good lead indicator of how the child athlete might succeed in the future. 
So you get the idea of lead and lag indicator, and that was just you know, kind of interesting for you. But we're Christians here trying to be disciples of Jesus, right? That's, if you're a Christian, you are trying to be a disciple of Jesus. You want to be more like Jesus. And by the way, if you're not a Christian, if you're exploring God in faith, we are so glad you are here on your faith journey. And you're like, oh my gosh, are you going to be talking about generosity and money and stuff? I'm really glad you're here because we're hoping to clear up a whole lot of misconceptions about God and money. Because frankly, we believe in an all-powerful, almighty God. We believe in a God that can raise a man from death and he's going to raise us from death. And if he can do that, if he owns everything, then he really doesn't need our money. Amen? Now, don't leave with your checkbook just yet. <laughs> so we're glad you're here, wherever you are on your faith journey. But here's what I want to focus on at the moment. What are the lead indicators to being a better disciple and being more like Jesus? What are those lead indicators? And, and there are many, but we're, we're going to focus on this one. Generosity. Generosity. I mean, you showed up, you saw the slide, you know we're focused on generosity, and so it's not that great big of a leap. But generosity is a lead indicator. Here's the problem. Too often, we would open the bulletin and we'd see, how much did people give? Or you'd go to the app and you'd see the generosity report and we'd see, how much did people give? That is a lag indicator. That's how much we collectively gave, and that's great. But we want to focus on lead indicators. See, what we gave is a lag measurement, we should focus on where our giving leads us. Where does our giving lead us? My goal this morning is to reframe the topic of generosity from the rules of giving to a prescription for living generosity. So let's consult to what Jesus and Paul say about living generously. And this is great because I don't have to create the sermon. They already gave me the sermons. I just get to repeat them. Now, one of the, uh, what we're going to do is get to the heart of the matter. We are literally going to get to the heart of the matter of generosity and becoming more and more like Jesus. So you heard this last week from Brandon when he kicked this, seri th th this series off. There, there's a lot about heart, right? Fill in the blank. The greatest commandment is this, love the Lord your God with all your soul and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Excellent. Um, heart is at the core of what we believe. It's the core of our religion. Uh, get this one. Above all else, guard your, for it is the wellspring of life. Excellent. And you know from biology, from anatomy, that the heart is absolutely uh, essential to our physical bodies. In our spiritual sense, the heart is what gives us our orientation to everything that we do. So we get it. Worship with all your heart. Guard your heart. Watch your heart. The heart is essential. But let's see what Jesus has to say about the heart. And I'm going to go to Jesus' probably most famous sermon. In your Bible, it's in, in our Bible, in all our Bibles, it's in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And it's called the Sermon on the Mount. We could spend months on the Sermon on the Mount. Our preaching team got together uh, uh, this week, and we're talking about 2024, and we could do a six-month series on the Sermon on the Mount. I encourage you, go read the Sermon on the Mount. It is the most provocative thing in the Gospels. But I'm not going to preach it. Let me just summarize it really quickly. In fact, if I had to summarize Matthew 5, 6, and 7, it's all about this. Kingdom heart. See, the people who had been worshiping had heard a whole lot about rules, and they were really trying to obey rules. They wanted to obey the rules because they felt that if they obey the rules, then they will get into the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus comes along and he says, frankly, Jody's summary, it's not just about the rules, it's about the heart. So he starts at the beginning, there's something called the Beatitudes. And he said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Okay, I need a pure heart. I need to love God with all my heart. I need to guard my heart. But how? And our natural inclination is to go to rules. 
We want to go to rules. But it's not rules. It's not rules that make us righteous. In fact, you can follow all the rules and still have hate in your heart. Look, Jesus says, the command is, thou shalt not murder. But if you call somebody a fool, you have hate in your heart, you're committing murder. In other words, we would call that character assassination. Now, Jesus is not creating a new rule. There's not a new rule that says, thou shalt not murder and thou shalt not slander. That's, that's the wrong way to look at it. What Jesus is saying, you need to change your heart. And if you change your heart, then not murdering and not slandering will just happen automatically. You don't have to worry about the rules. If you love and care for children, you really don't need to worry about the rule that says, slow down to 25 miles an hour in the neighborhood because you love and care for children and you're gonna be more careful. It's all about the heart. So we look at the, the Sermon on the Mount and what Jesus does, he loosens all the, the purity laws, all the laws about being righteous, and he binds even tighter any of the rules, any of the laws about loving one another and loving God. Go through the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus deals with anger, heart issue. Oh, I just lost my entire message. That's cool. Um, I, can, I can flex. Uh, anger, which is a heart issue. He says contempt is a heart issue. He says if you have excessive, excessive desire or lust, that is a heart issue. He says if you don't love your enemies, that is a heart issue. Over and over, divorce laws, hardness of the heart. Giving for personal glory, heart issue. Praying for personal glory, heart issue. Fasting for personal glory, heart issue. Heart, heart, heart. I get it. I need to deal with my spiritual heart, but how? Rules do not change your heart. Rules can't change your heart. And so finally, here it comes in Matthew chapter 6. We've been through 5. We're now in 6. Jesus is going to give us a solution, a way to help manage and deal with our heart and draw even closer to God. So if you want to turn to your Bible or scroll, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Lead indicator to your heart. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus is telling us how to deal with our heart. And if you want to change the position of your heart and the disposition of your heart, you've got to focus on the position of your treasure. Now, what do we mean by treasure? What do we mean by treasure? I've got three icons for you here. We mean your time, your calendar. The treasure is anything you're trying to protect, anything you want to put in a safe, anything you safeguard. We all safeguard our calendars, right? We, we schedule everything. Your time is one of the things that you treasure. Your finances, yes, you've been given money. Yes, money's an essential tool. We need it for life. It's one of your treasures. But here's another one, not just your financial capital, Come with me here. How about your emotional capital? Bearing one another's burdens. Loving neighbor as yourself. These are the things that we treasure. And frankly, sometimes it's kind of hard to pick up the phone and call that person because you know it's going to be a long conversation and it's going to be tough. And you've been through this time and time again, but that's our job as ministers and pastors to one another is to bear one another's burdens. These are our treasures. Now, we talked about treasure being the lead indicator to where your heart goes. It's as if there's a chain. It's as if your treasure is bound to your heart. And when you move your treasure, 
There your heart goes. It's not the other way around. If you wait till you feel like doing something, like giving something, it might not happen. But if you give to something, your heart will naturally go with it. Do you see how we've reversed this in the way we've grown up? You see this on television all the time. And it works sometimes. You'll see the, the crying puppies or, or the crying babies on the commercial, and they'll say, please give. They're trying to pull from you based on moving your heart. Jesus says it's the exact opposite. He says, move your treasure, and there your heart will be also. I can give some personal examples here. Now, I'm very aware of Ananias and Sapphira, so I'm not going to do any bragging here. I just want you to know some of the experiences that Bernice and I have had in our generosity and our giving and how it's moved our hearts. A church we were very involved with in Maryland decided we wanted to help with adoptions. And we got to help one particular couple adopt a child. Do you know how that moves our hearts on Facebook when we see that child growing up? in a safe and secure family, in our prayers. I've been very involved in a ministry in Haiti, caring for widows and orphans in distress, which is the religion that James says God finds great. And it started out with child sponsorship, you know, $30 a month, and, but it grew and it grew, and then I started visiting Haiti, and I started investing in going to Haiti, and eventually it became chairman of the board of the nonprofit, and let me tell you what, you don't want to be with me in a room at a party because within five minutes, I'm going to be talking about Haiti. Because my investment was in Haiti, my heart moved to children in Haiti. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. See, the location of your treasure determines your position and your disposition. Let me say that again. The location of your treasure determines your position and your disposition. In our preaching team meeting, preparing for this, Brick gave me a great line. God doesn't want what's in your wallets. He wants what's in your heart. And moving what's in your wallet moves your heart. Another thing about this, we talk about treasures in heaven. This is really, really interesting. Treasures in heaven, treasures in heaven. Treasures in heaven is not like a life insurance policy that only has value after you die. It's not. So I've got a graph here. There's kingdom of earth. We've got that on the bottom. You know, we've got the kingdom of earth moving along and, and this, that's where we are now. This is the kingdom of earth. And Jesus came. That was the inauguration of the kingdom of heaven, right? Because he kept saying, the kingdom is at hand. We often think that, and we know Jesus is coming back, we think that's when the kingdom begins, or we know that when we die, we go to heaven until he comes back, and we, uh, those who are alive will meet him in the air, and there's going to be the renewal of all things, which this church celebrates, but the kingdom of heaven is already at hand. Your treasures are not just what happens after you die when you make kingdom investments. No, the kingdom of heaven is now. You can make kingdom investments and see them now on this earth as we begin the renewal of all things now. We don't have to wait. We don't have to wait. We can make investments that make a kingdom impact today. I want to shift. I want to shift to how Paul picks up on this topic. Paul wrote over half of our New Testament. Paul preached. Paul started a whole lot of churches. And if you're with me in your Bibles, I want you to um, scroll over, I think it's uh, Timothy. Uh, and in Timothy 6, Timothy, by the way, was a young preacher. He was a protege of Paul. And Paul is writing to Timothy to give him guidance on how to be a church leader. And he says this, command those who are rich in this present world Command those who are rich in this present world. Now, you're like, well, who's rich? In this present world, in South Orange County, in the United States of America, you may not feel like it, but most of us are rich. Statistics are, if you make over $45,000 a year, you're in the top 4% of the globe. 
I don't say that to make you feel guilty. I know our cost of living is high. I know that there's a whole lot of reasons and, and maybe we need to be looking at net or something like that. But what Paul is doing here in this passage, he's commanding those who are rich in the world how to be rich. And he's also saying, if you ever wanna be rich in this world, this is how you wanna be rich. So in that, I think we're all involved. And let's read further. Command those who are rich in this present world because, by the way, we tend to think rich is a moving target. If you look at the statistics, right, uh, 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 everybody seems to think rich is twice as much as they currently make. Whenever they do the surveys, it's always twice as much. So if you make 30,000 a year, I'll be rich when I make 60. If you make 60, I'll be rich when I make 20. Rich is a moving target. It's hard. Um, so what does he say? Not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth which is so uncertain. I think what Paul's saying is being rich should come with a warning label. Warning, riches may cause arrogance or idolatry. Idolatry? Really, I mean, I don't have any idols, I don't have anything carved on my own. Anytime you're putting your faith in something besides God, it's akin to idolatry. Anytime you're putting your faith in your savings account, in your 401k, in your next paycheck, in that bonus, rather than God who's providing everything richly for our good, his good deeds, it's idolatry. I'm not saying 401ks are bad. I'm not saying retirement savings plans. I'm not saying... Say, I'm telling you, go to Financial Peace University. It's awesome. We need to be protecting our financial future so we can give more in our future. That's the change in perspective. Don't put, your riches, don't put your hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Here's the problem with proof texting. Many of you, maybe you've been abused, maybe your parents have been abused, there was some slick preacher with better hair than mine, and they were on TV and they said, just give and then you will get rich. And they probably took a verse like this or maybe the one in Malachi that says, test me in this and see if I will not float and throw open the floodgates of heaven, right, in terms of giving. And they'll take this verse and they'll stop right there and they'll say, oh, look, he's given us everything. He's given us everything so that we can enjoy riches. Keep going because this is a huge countercultural perspective here. This is the way Christians think about riches. Keep moving on. Paul tells us we get to enjoy what God has given us, but the danger of reading this verse out of context, the danger of proof texting, is we will totally miss the point. Verse 18, command them, those who are rich, those who want to be rich, to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. Now, I uh, kind of misused uh, my office hour opportunities this week uh, with uh, my New Testament history professor who's also very fluent in Greek, and I got his help looking at this verse. To be rich in good deeds. Rich in could also be interpreted as rich in, enriched. You see that? It's not just an outflow of your riches towards good deeds, although it is that. It's also be enriched by your good deeds. Take it in. This is where your wealth truly comes from. Be generous and be willing to share. Now, my professor said willing was also added in later. He thinks the Greek says, and just tell them to share. Not just willing, just share. And 19, and in this way, they will lay up treasure. There's that word again. They will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of life that is what? Truly life. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
And if you want life, if you want life that is truly life, the lead indicator to that is being rich in good deeds. So show me. I mean, come on. Who's rich in good deeds? We have examples of this all over the place and how being rich in good deeds is being better and rich in stuff. By the way, I, I looked up some statistics about stuff. Did you know in my lifetime, the square footage of the average home has more than doubled? Square footage of the average home has more than doubled in my lifetime, about 60 years. Despite the fact that the average family size has decreased from 3.6 people to 3.1. Now, I don't know how you get 0.6 of a person or 0.1 of a person, but we got bigger houses with fewer people. In my lifetime, did you know car ownership has doubled? We own twice as many cars today as we did 60 years ago. In my lifetime, we have way more screens, right? In my lifetime, you had one screen in the house, and we all argued over what we watched. Now you got lots of screens in the house, and you got lots of screens in your pocket, and you got screens everywhere. But are we happier? Are we happier with all our stuff? I'll ask a psychologist. Uh, this is David G. Myers, a PhD who published an article in American Psychologist. Compared with our grandparents, today's young adults have grown up with much more affluence, slightly less happiness, and a much greater risk of depression associated with social pathology. On becoming better off over the last four decades, we have not, it has not been accompanied by one iota of increased subjective well-being. Science and psychology has proved what Jesus preached 2,000 years ago, and Christians have been following ever since. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Also, I want to talk about a couple in our church, Brett and Joanne Clifford. Brett and Joanne Clifford <laughs> answered a call two years ago. We stood up here and we said, hey, we need people to work in our children's ministry. And Brett and Joanne did that. And they didn't decide just to work in children's ministry. They picked the most difficult thing, fourth and fifth graders, <laughs> preteens. And they show up every Sunday, and they show up midweek with these kids. And I've been watching Brett, and it's like, he's so excited to be there. He decided, they decided to invest their time. So I called Brett, and I said, why are you so happy? Why do you do this? And he gave me a story. And you need to ask Brett yourself. I won't do it justice. But when he was saved as a senior in high school, immediately they said, now you're going to work with junior high kids. So he's working with junior high kids before he had any spiritual capital, before he had any Bible knowledge, he's already investing in junior high kids. So he's got some background, he's got some, and, and uh, he's had a, a history working in the church, and he actually started a church, and he spent some time in Costa Rica, and a few years ago, he said he just felt burned out. He felt like, you know, that, that phase, that's done. I'm, God's maybe used me up working with kids. So two years ago, he answers the call. They decide to invest their time, their talent, their treasure. And you know what he said to me? Brett, I'm quoting here. It has given me new life. He's just repeating what Paul told us. Taking hold of life that is truly life. And oh, by the way, Brett and Joanne's son, um, Nate, he serves on the worship team. And Nate's wife, Danielle, he and Danielle, they serve in our church. So again, going back to that lead indicator that parents can give you a good clue to what their children are gonna be like. There's truth there, but that's a completely different sermon. Okay, so what, now what? So what, yeah, great, Jody. Jesus, throne on the mount, heart, Paul, rich and good deeds, all that. What do I do? Here's a question I'd ask you to consider. Look, I believe 99% of the people that had a heart attack thought their heart was just fine. I don't feel like I'm having a cardiac issue until you are having a cardiac issue. 
So that's why we go to the doctor and we do diag diagnostic tests, right? You might do a stress test. They'll do blood pressure tests, systolic and diastolic, and they'll test all this stuff to really tell you the condition of your heart. And then the doctor might give you some commands. Stop eating salt. Start working out. Start exercising. Beef, I know you love it, but you got to lay away. Here's the difference. <laughs> because we have faith in our doctor, we follow our doctor's commands. Because we've done the diagnostics with our doctor, then we decide we need to move things. We want to move the condition of our heart. We start obeying the commands that will do that. So here's what I want you to do. Go back to those three icons. You can do this alone. You can do this with your significant other. This is a great conversation. I want you to look at your calendar for the last three months. This is diagnostics. Just look at your calendar for the last three months. I'm not here to condemn. I'm not here to make you feel guilty. But if the Holy Spirit convicts, Gina preached this. If the Holy Spirit convicts, that's a good invitation. It's not about leaving it at conviction. It's about invitation to something greater. And if your calendar doesn't show a lot of time devoted where you really want it to be devoted so that you can have life that is truly life, look at your financial statements. Where are you giving? And look at your relationships. Are you bearing burdens? Because that's what we Christians are supposed to do. Now, I'm not here to convict. That's just the assessment. Doctor, you come in, the doctor says, well, your heart rate's really high, your resting heart rate, and da-da-da-da-da. But I have a solution for you. You need to change some things. So here's part two. I want you to go back to your calendar for the next three months and schedule some things. Schedule. I'm not saying your entire calendar. Maybe start with an hour a week. And I don't know where that is. Let the Spirit tell you. And your finances? I know, 10% and tithing and all that. Start with one. Start with one. Start moving your heart. Because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And emotional capital? That's why groups are so important to us here. It's not just what we learn in groups. It's the relationships that we have in groups. Look at those three areas. Assess, and then budget. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we've got two passages left and then we'll be done. Paul says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously, there's our word, will reap generously. And each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give not under Compulsion, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. This is not about guilt. This is about making you happy. <laughs> this is about doing things that will allow you to grab hold of life that is truly life and treasures in heaven, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God now. Here's another one of those verses that's taken out of context when you don't look at the whole thing. Verse 8. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Be rich in good deeds. And God's going to provide the capital necessary for you to do that. I'm going to wrap it up in this. Look, there are a lot of generous people in the world. There are foundations. There are philanthropists. There are people that give, and they've done great things. Wiped out disease, eradicated diseases, improved health, built hospitals. So what's the difference between a secular philanthropist and a Christian giver? I mean, can I give outside of the Christian context? And yes, you can. And frankly, they're probably still doing the work of God. But what's the difference? I'd say this. The former 
they're probably saying, I have more than enough. Therefore, I'm going to give some of my leftovers, and I got a lot left over. But they're giving leftovers. And they're saying, I am giving to something. Here's how we Christians view giving and generosity. He has more than enough. I am giving my first fruits deliberately planned. First fruits are deliberately planned, trusting, and I'm not giving to, he is giving through me. He is giving through me. This is our last passage that we're going to look at, Paul. Paul lived a life that was difficult and it was tough. He gave everything. He said he became all things to all people so that he might win some to know the Lord. He suffered in prison. He died a martyr's death. And he knew he was going to do that. He paid for his own ministry as a tent maker. And in all that, he says, I do all of this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Are you kidding me? We get to. We get to be agents of the gospel. We get to be the throughput of the love of God. We get to be the ones that in some small way represent the image of God, the Imago Dei, when we choose to be generous. Let's pray. Father God, a message like this hits us in a whole lot of places. Some of us have been giving and, and we've been generous and we've been following the rules for years. But we've been obeying commands and not tending to our heart. We know, Father, you don't want what's in our wallet. You want what's in our heart. You want something for us, you want us to gain life that is truly life. Father, some of us come here and we've been abused. We've been guilted into giving. We're tired. Father, help us to change our mentality to see it's not what you want from us, it's what you want for us. And Father, some of us feel like, yeah, I'd love to give, but do you know my schedule? Do you know my debt? Do you know what I'm going through? I just don't have it. Father God, would you give us insight into our calendar, into our bank statements, and into our relationships to find places where we can begin and make those kingdom investments. 